for this. As I was saying, we had to rush through it, but we sort of <coughs> did Gauss-Jordan elimination um, Thursday of last week. There are like videos and stuff on Canvas if you want to see more of that. We're, uh, we're not going to be spending this semester doing that by hand. That's obviously totally unfeasible. So I thought maybe um, I'd start this day by showing you how it's done on the calculator. So let's go ahead and solve a system of linear equations. Y equals plus z equals eight. X minus two y minus three z equals zero. Negative x plus y plus two z equals three. Yeah. And uh, this, now before I go to our calculator, so let's remind ourselves what we're going to do here. We're going to store this system as an augmented matrix. And in this matrix, each column corresponds to a variable, except that last column, which corresponds to a quality. And every row corresponds to an equation. So like the, sec the last row corresponds to the equation negative 1x plus 1y plus 2z equals 3 which is precisely what you see there. Then we're going to put this into reduced row echelon form, and reduced row echelon form is, re I mean, it can be a little complicated if you have infinite solutions, but what we're expecting is that we'll get something so simple, we can just read x, y, and z right off. So now that we're clear that our goal is to work with this matrix, let's go to our calculator. So this requires more button presses than it seems to me that it really should, but uh, you see matrix in blue here up above this uh, X inverse button. So our calculator is color coded, remember, we press the second button then this, and there's something already there from last semester. I'm gonna real quick just reset this thing. Oh, I, I don't know what entries I cleared. They obviously weren't the matrix and Trees. Uh, second plus. Yeah, I'm pressing enter. I need plus. Let's just reset this real quick. Okay, so now we go to this matrix menu. We don't see anything. Uh, well, that's not quite true. We see a bunch of uh, vetters. These are all places we can store a matrix into. 
then this is where we go to do stuff to the matrix. It's going to be where we find the Gauss-Jordan elimination. But first, we need to enter the matrix. So I'm going left and right with these arrow keys. Edit. Uh, A is fine. It doesn't matter which of these we select. And it's going to start by asking how big this matrix is. Uh, remember that it's rows by columns. So one, two, three rows, one, two, three, four columns. So it's a three by four matrix. And now we, we enter the matrix. We use the arrow keys and the numerical buttons. So zero, two, one, negative eight. It's always probably quicker doing this by hand than on the screen. One, negative two, negative three, zero, negative one, one, two, three. And you try to be careful because if you press the wrong button at any point, then you get the wrong answer and maybe don't know why. So that looks good to me. We have to then quit out. There is no way to go directly from that back into the matrix menu. And it's, uh, it's second mode to quit out of a menu. Then we go back into the matrix menu and you see that now there's um, something next to this A. It's telling us that we've entered something here, that A is now storing a three by four matrix. Go over to math, quite a list here. We are scrolling down. It's Gauss-Jordan elimination, but we're scrolling down to RREF. We're putting this in reduced row echelon form. So we press enter. We get kicked out of the matrix menu. We go back into the matrix menu. We click enter. We um, names is where we want to be now. We select this matrix and our calculator will actually run if we don't close the parentheses, a rare case where syntax doesn't matter. But we press the enter button and Gauss-Jordan elimination is performed. And we get, we're gonna, I'm gonna have to go back and forth, but that first row was one, zero, zero, four. Zero, one, zero, negative five. Zero, zero, one, two. And now in this reduced matrix, These rows still correspond to variables, except, I mean, these columns do, except for the last column, which is equality. 
and these rows still correspond to equations, but now the equations are so simple we can solve for x, y, and z. The first row says that x plus 0, y plus 0, z equals 4. So x equals 4. That second row, y equals negative 5. That third row, z equals 2. And assuming that there's only one solution, which is not always the case, there could be infinite solutions, but when there's only one solution, a matrix in reduced row echelon form is always going to look like this. One's down the diagonal, the solutions in the far right, everything else zero. And get used to that because we're going to be doing it a lot in this course. Uh, Gauss-Jordan elimination will be a, um, a tool that we use throughout the entire semester. And I, I'll say it's almost always going to be Gauss-Jordan elimination. This is we don't really do numerical linear algebra in this course. Like, we don't count flops to decide how fast an algorithm is. But um, the, the Gauss-Jordan algorithm first performs Gaussian elimination. First, it puts the thing in row echelon form. Then it puts it in reduced row echelon form. And the part where it puts it in row echelon form is the part where it has to work. It's the most time-consuming part of the process. Going back up, and getting reduced row echelon form is very quick by comparison. So there are going to be times in this course where we really only need row echelon form, but I basically always use reduced row echelon form. We save very little time by not doing that. And I think it's easier for students if it's like if it's always just reduced row echelon form instead of, well, sometimes we need one and sometimes we need the other, and it depends on the context. We've seen, uh, just looking at a little two by two matrices, that, or two by two systems, I guess. This was before we introduced matrices. But we've seen that systems of linear equations don't have to have solutions. And now we've seen this solution method. What happens if we have a system with no solutions and we hit it with this method? Let's let's uh, investigate this via example. X plus Y plus Z equals one. X minus Y plus 2z equals 3, 2x plus 3z equals 1. Uh, here's a system that I've built not to have solutions. And I mean, the way I built it not to have solutions was that in the first equation, 
these two things are equal. In the second equation, these two things are equal. I added the first, I mean, I added the equations on the left. So this equation plus this equation ought to equal this number plus this number. I put a one there instead of a four. So going into this, there shouldn't be solutions. But what happens, I mean, if I don't see that? What happens if I try to solve this using Gauss-Jordan elimination? And let me, one, 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 one. I know you probably can't see the dying green marker. This is for me so that I don't have to constantly go back to the white. So we put this down somewhere. So we're working with the matrix one, 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 negative one, two, three, two, zero, three, one. Let's separate this off. And now let's go to um, our calculator. I normally just, I mean, I'm done with this matrix. I don't normally bother going into the memory to delete matrices. I normally just overwrite matrices when I'm done with them. So let's take this matrix A and let's enter this new matrix over it. One, 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 negative one, two, three, two, zero, three, one. And we can always perform Gauss-Jordan elimination. The fact that we don't have any solutions is not going to break the reduced row echelon form algorithm. What it's... I, ah, okay. What it's going to do is give us this matrix. Tricks. And um, I'll copy this matrix down, but the, the important thing here is that last row. Let's go The last row is zero, 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 one. And again, each of these rows is an equation. Each of these columns is a variable, except the last column, which is a quality. So the first row says that x plus 1.5z equals zero. That's fine. The second row says that y minus one half z equals zero. That's fine. The third row says that zero x plus zero y plus zero z equals one. And that's not fine. I mean, there is no value of x, y, and z as you could pick that would make zero equal to one. So the algorithm worked just fine. It gave us a uh, matrix in reduced row echelon form, but 
the system corresponding to this matrix is inconsistent. It doesn't have solutions. And again, it doesn't have solutions because of this last row that says that is zero equals one. We'll formalize this a little. We'll start by state, stating this informally, which I mean, when you're starting out, informal is probably actually more useful than a more formal definition. A system of linear equations has no solutions this is an if and only if statement if and only if when you hit it, or I guess I should say when you hit its augmented matrix with Gauss Jordan elimination. You get a row that is all zeros except for the last entry, which is not zero. Um, And that's precisely what we had uh, on the previous frame. We had a row that was zero, 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 and then the last entry wasn't zero, the last entry was one. A remark I have about this, um, it's a little unfortunate, I guess, but it's just the way things are. Um, there's really no way to know whether a system of linear equations is going to have solutions until you've done the work to find the solutions. Like, in a, in a perfect world, we would be able to decide whether there are solutions before we do Gauss-Jordan elimination, because doing Gauss-Jordan elimination is how we find solutions. But that's, that's not the situation that we're in. The solution finding method is also how you decide whether solutions exist. Um, that being said, for matrices of sort, I mean, even like 50 by 50 or 100 by 100, uh, computer algebra, I mean, maybe not your calculator, obviously that's a relatively weak computer algebra system, but, um, Gauss-Jordan elimination is a relatively quick algorithm. It's a state, if you, if you mess around a little behind the scenes, it's a stable algorithm, which means that for if you have a little rounding error to start with, like you have one third, but your calculator rounds that as point three. 
three, 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 three. That tiny bit of rounding error at the start is going to result in just a tiny bit of rounding error at the end. There are algorithms where that's not true, where small rounding error at the start will grow and get worse and worse and worse. But um, gauss jordan elimination, computers perform it quickly and easily. So having to perform it isn't, you know, a huge problem. Let's see. This is actually a situation um, we only really need to hit it with Gaussian elimination. But going back to what I said earlier, you save so little time using Gaussian versus Gauss-Jordan that I always just use Gauss-Jordan. Um, formalizing this and introducing some definitions that we're going to want a little later. A pivot position in a matrix is an entry that will be a leading entry once this elimination has been performed. And a, a sort of sister or maybe a daughter definition, a pivot column is a column with a pivot position in it. So there's no way to um to just look at a matrix and read the pivot positions and the pivot columns off you have to put in the work and perform the gaussian or gauss jordan elimination i'm going back to this matrix Erase some unwanted stuff. Um, the pivot positions of this matrix are this and this and this. First row, first column. Second row, second column. Third row, last column. And that's corresponding to the first, to the leading entries, to the first non-zero entries in the matrix after we've hit it with Gauss-Jordan elimination. And there's no way to just look at the matrix and, as I say, read them off. You have to perform the elimination process. Right, here, 
the pivot positions are different. This is not a leading entry. I mean, there's a zero there. The leading entry in the first row is that two. But it will be a leading entry after you perform the elimination. So um, it's a pivot position. <clears throat> so those are the pivot positions of that matrix. We can certainly uh, shorten this theorem a great deal as long as we, um, we are willing to use this new definition. Theorem, a system has solutions if and only if, and I'm going to get a little sloppy here, systems don't have columns, the augmented matrices of systems have columns, but that gets a little tedious writing it down. Um, a system has solutions if and only if, it's the last column is not a pivot column. Again, going back to what we've looked at, this system didn't have solutions, and there was a pivot position in the last column. So the last column is a pivot column. This did have solutions. There is no pivot position in the last column. So the last column is not a pivot column. We are going to use uh, this definition of pivot positions and pivot columns to investigate the next question. We've said already, remember, a system can have zero or one or infinitely many solutions. And we've looked at what happens when there are zero solutions, and we've looked at a case where there's one solution. What's it look like when there are infinitely many solutions? Let's, uh, Let's find out here's a system that I've designed to have infinitely many solutions. So hopefully it didn't uh, mess that up. That's I always want to just go to the calculator, but since this is new to you, we should remind ourselves what we're doing. We're writing down the augmented matrix of the system. Um, and then we're working with it. Again, I'm just going to overwrite what we have here. Well, actually, this first row and 
is correct. Let's see. The second row was, I want to say, one negative one, one, two, one negative one, one, two, and two, zero, two, three. Quit out, go back in, RREF is towards the bottom, save a few button presses, a few go up. Okay, and we get this. Um, so there are solutions, first of all. It's okay to have zeros in this bottom row as long as the last entry is also zero. And uh, we get equations this time. X plus Z equals 1.5. Y equals negative 0.5. This third row says that zero equals zero, which isn't helpful, but also is a true statement. It's not hurting anything. So, there are infinitely many solutions. Uh, that's because, I mean, the second row tells us what y is, that y is negative 0.5, but the first row is just a relationship between x and z. x plus z equals 1.5. So x equals 1.5, z equals 0, y equals negative 0.5 is a solution. x equals 0.5, z equals 1, y equals negative 0.5 is a solution. There are infinitely many solutions. We've got, remember that these rows correspond to variables except for the last row which corresponds to equality and in terms of the definitions uh, that we just presented um, pivot positions and pivot columns well, our pivot positions are there. So our pivot columns are the first column and the second column. And you see that X and Y, the columns that correspond to X and Y, are pivot columns, but that's not true for Z. The column that corresponds to Z is not a pivot column. So, I mean, this definition, I hope it's clear what I'm saying when I'm talking about columns corresponding to variables and so on. A variable is basic if its column is 
a pivot column. A variable is free if its column is not a pivot column. So some echoes of college or high school algebra here. Free variables are playing kind of the role that independent variables play in those classes, which is why their names are similar. And um, in, in algebra, if you have an independent variable and a dependent variable, you should have an infinite number of solutions, right? Like if you have both a dependent and an independent variable, all of the points on the line are going to be a solution to that. There will be infinitely many. If you just have one variable, let me, uh, which would it be? If you don't have writing the wrong thing down. If you don't really writing the wrong thing down, this, this sort of uh, aside has taken on uh, more importance than it really deserved. But if you don't have your x variable, if you don't have your independent variable, then y is just fixed. So sort of with that in the back of our mind, assuming at least one solution exists if all variables are basic there's only one solution. If there's at least one free variable, there will be infinitely many. So going back to the system that, has, that I said has infinitely many solutions, This z variable is a free variable. The x and the y are basic. Um, it's important to first ask yourself whether there are any solutions. Going back to this example, z 
is a free variable here. Um, that last column is not a pivot column, but there aren't infinitely many <coughs> solutions because there aren't any solutions. Zero is not equal to one. So first you decide whether solutions exist. Then you can decide whether there is just one or infinitely many solutions. We'll say more about this infinite solution case a little down the road. Um, we're not like, there, there are obviously things to say about it. Like, if there's one solution, you can just write that solution down. If there are infinitely many, you can't write them all down. So how do you express the solution set? For now, uh, we'll put this aside and we'll start section 1.3. Uh, does anybody have questions about 1.2?